we're right on time, which is surprising for any gathering, including Orthodox people. <laughs> Our keynote speaker is one of the most accomplished scholars of the 20th and 21st centuries. He has a very complete biography in the program, and I'm not going to read it word for word. He is a Catholic priest of the Byzantine Slavonic Rite and a member of the Society of Jesus. He received his doctorate in Eastern Christian Studies with specialization in Oriental Liturgy in 1970 at the Pontifical Oriental Institute in Rome, followed in 1971-72 by postdoctoral studies in Oriental Philology at the Catholic University of Louvain, Belgium. In 1970, he was appointed to the faculty of the Pontifical Oriental Institute in Rome, where he has served as professor of Oriental Liturgy since 1970, prefect of the library from 1981 to 85, and vice rector of the institute from 1995 to 2001. Having reached the age of retirement in 2002, he automatically became professor emeritus, though he continued to teach until 2008. His major life's work is a six-volume monograph series titled A History of the Liturgy of St. John Chrysostom, the final volume of which is in press in addition to hundreds of other scholarly books, articles, essays, and lectures. His service to the academy as a teacher, mentor, and scholar is immeasurable, as is his lifelong devotion and contribution to ecumenism, especially interfaith dialogue between the Roman Catholic and Orthodox churches. As a junior scholar of liturgy and sacramental theology, I never had the privilege of sitting at his feet, as it were, yet I consider myself to be a graduate of his school as I was profoundly shaped and formed by his teaching by learning directly from his protégés, Dr. Paul Meyendorf of St. Vladimir Seminary, and Father Mark Morozovich, who is now the Dean of the School of Theology and Religious Studies at the Catholic University of America, not to mention from immersing myself in his many scholarly works. It is thus truly an honor and a privilege to welcome our commandrate Robert Taft, our keynote speaker. Thank you very much, Father Deacon. In Western Christendom, there is no iconography in the Byzantine Orthodox sense of the term. Western churches, like those in Ravenna or St. Mark's in Venice, are the result of Byzantine influence and are borrowed, not indigenous, Western art. So I shall concentrate my remarks on the Byzantine East, where my competency lies. But before doing that, let me clear away some of the popular cliches concerning Byzantine religious culture and art. The myth that Byzantine liturgy and iconography were more spontaneous and freewheeling over against the rubricistic legalism of the canonically obsessed Latins is simply nonsense. In actual fact, the observance of an established taxis or order was fundamental to the Byzantine worldview in both church and state. Secondly, the view of, the Byzanti of Byzantine church iconography as abstract and unrealistic is but another cliché. Though Byzantine iconography and liturgy are, of course, highly symbolic, that does not mean that they are abstract. In the middle and late Byzantine periods, when the Byzantine rite's symbolic form was consolidating, Byzantine liturgy and church iconography moved deliberately from the symbolic to the narrative and concrete. The third era views iconography as non-realistic. For the Byzantine themselves, Byzantines themselves regarded it as highly naturalistic. When the patriarch St. Photius described a mosaic of the Virgin in Santa Sophia, Hagia Sophia, he praised it as a lifelike imitation that's a quote. The virgin's lips, he continues, have been made flesh by the colors, and though still, they were not incapable of speaking, end quote. 
Again, the Emperor Leo VI, commenting on a mosaic of Christ in the dome of a church, says that it appeared to be not a work of art, but Christ himself, who had momentarily stilled his lips. Numerous other texts repeat the same topoi. So Byzantine spiritual culture is far from abstract and otherworldly. Religious architecture and monumental art constitute the most palpable remains of Byzantine spirituality. In their reliance on these strictly visual, physical means, the Byzantines communicated not only their deepest spiritual sensibilities, but also their most sophisticated theological thoughts regarding the structure of the heavenly kingdom upon which they believed their own empire had been modeled. Preconcepts are seminal for understanding this Byzantine liturgical and iconographic vision. The Byzantines called them in Greek, taxis, historia, theoria. Let us translate them as order, right, and contemplation. First, taxis, or order. The Byzantines saw the taxis, or order, of their highly ritualized society in Neoplatonic terms as images or reflections of the celestial world. Earthly institutions, both ecclesiastical and temporal, were considered to mirror the order of the universe, a cosmic array created by God. There was also a theology underlying this taxis. For the Byzantines, the connection between heaven and earth realized in the mysteries of the Trinity and Christ and in church services, icon worship, and the system of images had its theological basis in the mystery of the Incarnation. What had once been seen as an unbridgeable gulf between the divinity and humankind had for Christians been bridged by the eternal word of God made flesh in the God-man Jesus. In other words, Byzantine Orthodox Christians based the realism of their liturgy and its iconography on faith in the reality of the permanent presence of the risen Christ. So Jesus is not extraneous to the heavenly earthly liturgy of the church, but its first protagonist. As the Byzantine liturgy prays, and I quote, you are the one who offers and is offered, who receives the offering and is given back to us, end quote. In this theology, church ritual constitutes both a representation and a representation, a rendering present again, of the earthly saving work of Christ. This vision, common also to the patristic West, St. Simeon of Thessalonica, who died in 1429, vests in Byzantine theological dress. I quote, Jesus, who is bodiless, ineffable, and cannot be apprehended, but who for our sakes assumed a body and becoming comprehensible, was seen and conversed with men, remaining God, so that he might sanctify us in a twofold manner, according to that which is invisible and that which is visible. And thus he transmitted the sacraments to us in a twofold form, at once visible and material for the sake of our body, and at the same time intelligible and mystical, and filled with invisible grace for the sake of our soul. There is one in the same church above and below, he continues, since God came and appeared among us and was seen in our form and accomplished what he did for us. And the Lord's priestly activity in communion and contemplation constitute one single work which is carried out at the same time, both above and here below, but with this difference. Above it is done without veils and symbols, but here it is accomplished through symbols. End of quote. Paper sticks together in this nice California weather. I never knew before I came here that California, that uh, Los Angeles was located in Alaska. <laughs> this symbolism becomes truly operative and appears in its fullness only in the living icon of the liturgy celebrated in the Byzantine church with its decorative iconographic programs. By obliterating the distinction between architecture, between architecture and decoration, the interior of the Byzantine church building becomes a concrete image of the Christian vision where building and icon become one, in evoking that vision of the Christian cosmos around which the Byzantine liturgy revolves. 
From the central dome, the image of the Pantocrata dominates the whole scheme, giving unity to the heavenly earthly liturgy and salvation history themes. The movement of the former is vertical, uniting the present worshiping community here below, assembled in the nave, with the rest of the communion of saints depicted in ranks of confessors and martyrs, prophets, patriarchs, apostles, ascending to the Lord in the heavens, where he's depicted there in the, in the dome, attended by the heavenly choirs. But it is only with the liturgical theme that the symbolism of the church building comes alive. The enclosed sanctuary, wherein the mysteries of the covenant are renewed, is conceived as the divine abode, its iconostasis enclosure as the link between heaven and earth, through whose central doors grace irradiates out from heaven, the sanctuary, to earth, the nave, the body of the church where the people are. Before these holy doors, the deacon, mediator between the various orders in the church and leader of the people and their intercessions, stands at the head of the congregation, knocking at the gates of heaven through prayer. Behind the altar on the wall of the sanctuary apse, the apse is, the, is the, uh, what covers, it's the roof, in other words, of the, the apse is that circular area of the building where the sanctuary is traditionally located. Behind the, wall, on the wa behind the altar on the wall of the sanctuary apse are depicted the great fathers, especially the liturgical fathers, St. Basil the Great and St. John Chrysostom, to whom the Orthodox Eucharistic liturgies are attributed. They stand around the altar bowed in the traditional posture of Byzantine liturgical prayer, holding scrolls with the text of the liturgy as if concelebrating, as indeed they are, in the one liturgy of the communion of saints in heaven and on earth. Overhead in the conch, that is to say the roof of the apse, appears the mother of God, arms extended in the orant position, and in his cedar for our salvation, sending up to the heavenly altar our worship from the altar before her in the sanctuary below. A medallion, in other words, a, a circle, in her bosom, or the mandilion above her, may depict the Christ, figure of the incarnation that made this sacrificial intercession possible. Above this, at the summit of the arch, may be depicted the itimasia, or throne of divine judgment, where the sacrificial mediation intercedes on our behalf, in the words of the liturgy, for a good answer before the judgment seat of Christ. Outside the chancel barrier, cycles of the gospel mysteries of Christ's life are depicted clockwise in a lateral band of fresco panels that extend around the walls of the church, building past salvation history into its ongoing salvific continuation in the liturgy. Within this setting, the liturgical community commemorates the mystery of its redemption in union with the worship of the heavenly church offering the mystery of Christ's covenant through the outstretched hands of his mother, all made visibly present in the imagery of the iconographic scheme. As St. Simeon of Thessalonica, whom we already saw, last of the classic Byzantine liturgical commentators, explains in his dialogue against old heresies, I quote, the church is the house of God is an image of the whole world, for God is everywhere and above everything. The sanctuary is a symbol of the higher and supra-heavenly supra spheres where the throne of God and his dwelling place are said to be. It is this throne that the altar represents. The heavenly hierarchies are found in many places, but here they are accompanied by priests who take their place. The bishop represents Christ. The church represents this visible world. The upper regions of the church represent the visible heavens. Its lower parts, what is on earth, and the earthly paradise itself. Outside are the lower regions and the world of beings that live not according to reason and have no higher life. The sanctuary receives within itself the bishop who represents the God-man Jesus, whose almighty powers he shares. The other sacred ministers represent the apostles and especially the angels and archangels, each according to his order. I mention the apostles with the angels, bishops, and priests, because there is only one church above and below. That final sentence says it all. That's what we're talking about in symbol, but also in reality. There is one single church above and below, and what we do below in church 
symbolized in the Byzantine liturgy is an actual participation in the eternal sacrifice that Christ continues to offer before the heavenly altar of the Father in heaven. That's what gives it its realism in Christian faith. What we do is simply a reflection and an actual participation in the very same reality. In the declining years of Byzantium, this synthesis achieved its classical expression around 1350 in St. Nicholas Cavasilas's brilliant treatises, his commentary on the divine liturgy, and his The Life in Christ on the other sacraments. Cavasilas's interpretation is in no way extrinsic to the structure <coughs> and meaning of the rites, nor is his contemplation a substitute for sacramental participation but only its prelude. The divine liturgy, Kavasilas teaches, is ordered, he writes, toward, I quote, the sanctification of the faithful, who through these mysteries receive the remission of their sins in the inheritance of the heavenly kingdom. All else, the antiphons, lessons, prayers, chants, is meant to dispose one for this central sacramental communion. They turn us towards God, he says, and make us fit for the reception and preservation, and preservation of the holy mysteries, which is the aim of the liturgy. But, he continues, there is another level of liturgical sanctification, another way in which these forms sanctify us. It consists in this, that in them Christ and the deeds he accomplished and the sufferings he endured for our sakes are represented. Indeed, it is the whole scheme of the work of redemption which is signified in the psalms and readings as in all the actions of the priest throughout the liturgy. Their purpose is to set before us the divine plan, that by looking upon it our souls may be sanctified and thus we may be made fit to receive these sacred gifts. So the mystagogy, the explanation, is not a substitution for the actual participation in the liturgy, it simply prepares the Christian soul to do so properly. The quote continues, Just as the work of redemption, when it was first achieved, restored the world, so now, when it is ever before our eyes, it makes the, thank you very much, it makes the souls of those who behold it better and more divine. Thus, in beholding the unutterable freshness of the work of salvation, amazed by the abundance of God's mercy, we are brought to venerate him who has had, him, excuse me, <clears throat> him who had such compassion for us, who saved us at so great a price, to entrust our souls to him, to dedicate our lives to him, to enkindle in our hearts the flame of his love. Thus prepared, we can enter into contact with the fire of the solemn mysteries with confidence and trust. End of quotation. This is no intellectualist spirituality, no lofty Gnosticism of a spiritual elite, but a profoundly imaginative popular piety. Nothing could be further than this fixed, unified, coherent synthesis of image and right from the contemporary postmodern mentality in much of the West, where cafeteria style religion prevails and one picks and chooses from this smorgasbord only what suits one's taste. But that is all wrong. For what we're doing at Christian services is a special kind of remembering. It's what we call liturgy, a fancy name for what religious communities do when they gather to express in prayer and gesture and song what they are. Liturgy activates the group's heritage expressing its collective identity. It helps communities maintain their cohesion, what they are, their beliefs relating to the basic questions of life. It's a group's way of telling its story, of saying what it is. Now, what any group is includes a past, a present, and a future. The past that made it what it is, the present in which it lives that reality, and the future it hopes to be. That's why our liturgical prayers in any traditional Christian liturgy are full of past, present, and future, as in the Roman Mass, for example, in the former Isol translation.
Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again, past, present, future. Dying, you restored our death, past. Rising, you restored our life, present. Lord Jesus, come in glory, future. Past, present, future, over and over and over again. This depends, first of all, on remembrance or memorial, called anamnesis in Greek, constantly mispronounced anamnesis, in the Greek New Testament. Christ said, do this in my memory or in memory of me. So this is a recalling, a retelling of those events recounted in the Bible that have been transformed in the collective memory of the community into key symbolic episodes defining the community's being and self-understanding. For Orthodox and Catholic Christians, it is the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We celebrate our new covenant in Jesus in the memorial of the Lord's Supper and other sacraments like baptism. But it is always the same root metaphor that returns again and again in every celebration. Jesus Christ died and rose for our salvation, and we must die to sin in order to rise to new life in him. That's the basis for what we are and do at liturgy following Jesus' command, do this in memory of me. To paraphrase Don Gregory Dix, famous Anglican theologian, never in history has a command been better obeyed. Century after century, in every country and among every race, men and women have gathered publicly or in secret, legally or illegally, to do this same action in obedience to that command. It has been done in every conceivable human circumstance, from catacomb to cathedral, in peaceful village churches or on the fields and ships of war, <coughs> and for every conceivable human need. Nothing better has been found to do for kings at their crowning, for a council in the splendors of St. Peter's in Rome, or by a secretly consecrated Russian Orthodox bishop <coughs> in a prison camp in the frozen Siberian tundra. Down through the ages, the command, do this in memory of me, has been obeyed faithfully, constantly obeyed, at least until the 1960s, when some Americans of the 60s generation began to decide they knew better, began to say they didn't get anything out of going to church. Well, what one gets out of it, as the millions once behind the Iron Curtain in the former Soviet Empire have rediscovered, now that they are free to do so, is the inestimable privilege of being able to glorify Almighty God. For neither life nor liturgy is a cafeteria-style pick-and-choose buffet, but the will of God for all, whether one knows it or likes it or not. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Father Taft, for your lecture. We have time for uh, Q&A from the audience. And at this time, um, we invite you to come forward to either side, to either microphone. Uh, we have approximately 15 or 20 minutes, about 20 minutes for Q&A. I should first apologize. The first time in my life I've ever given a lecture sitting down, but I simply am unable in my decrepit old age to stand. I, I used to tell my students, and that's still true, I've never had a good teacher who sat down teaching. If you never sign up for a class where whoever is teaching sits down. <laughs> I thank you for letting me ask this particular question for this. My question for this morning is this, that 
Well, yesterday and today, we are basically being introduced to icons. Speak more slowly. I'm as deaf as a haddock. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm motorized, but I, even with help, I... I shall do. Uh, since yesterday and today, we were basically being introduced by icons and images. My question is this, that in scriptures, it teaches us about images and icons. I would like to have your um, comment, or uh, explain my question out here. Your uh, apologetically to uh, explain, because there is a, through the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church, to really devent or really clarify this situation, what icons are for us, because Scripture teaches us they shall not have any images before me. C can you clarify this, please? There is no, uh, there is no special theology of iconography in the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church accepts all religious cultures. We have to realize that whatever brings anybody to God is a good thing, provided it does not express unorthodox theology. Uh, so does the Catholic Church accept iconography? Now, how you explain that, you'll have to ask the, the um, experts in iconography. Uh, that can be expressed in many ways, as we heard in some of the talks we've had already. Some, some would call them windows to another world. Uh, others don't like that expression. Uh, I have no dog in that fight, as they say. Anything, my belief is that anything that leads us to God and does not contradict in any way anything orthodox in our Christian, our common Christian Catholic Orthodox faith, uh, which is the same thing. The only the Catholics and Orthodox are the same soup, as far as I'm concerned. It's only the it's only the pot that differs. You know. <laughs> I don't know if that satisfies your. Uh, yes. Thank you. Fine. I have an article coming out in the next issue of uh, St. Vladimir's uh, Seminary Theological Quarterly, I guess they call it now, uh, where I propose, a, uh, I propose an ecumenical, that is to say, a, a peaceful and non-controversial solution to what some people like to propose as the uh, contradiction in Catholic Orthodox theology um, for the, uh, what what is the formula of the Eucharistic consecration. I mean, those who know something and know how to think have already passed way beyond that sort of dispute, and I try and lay that out. Much of what people claim divides Catholics and Orthodox is simply because they don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> Go ahead, Father. Oh, <clears throat> Father Archimander, uh, at the end of your, uh, your dissertation, you sort of opened the door to a... Uh, uh, or you sort of opened the door and then sort of slammed it on the uh, postmodern. I'm thinking you're t you were sort of alluding to postmodern, what they call it, emergent church. This, this. Uh, no, this I wasn't talking about any emergent church. I was talking about what we call the me generation, to which I have never belonged. Mm -hmm. I have never thought that my autobiography is salvation history. So, so that kind of puts the kibosh on this whole reader response church stuff. I think one of the problems with uh, the me generation is that uh, they think it's about them. It's not about us. It's about Almighty God and what he has given us and what he expects us to do with it. If people would get that through their skulls, I think there'd be a lot less uh, religious tension and uh, a lot less uh, loss in religious practice. But of course, one of the reasons for the loss in religious practice, and this is not only among the young, uh, but among others, is the fact that our churches in many ways are in serious trouble. And if you don't think so, open your eyes, you see. We badly need reform. I speak for the Catholic Church. I used to tell my students in Rome, uh, all of our churches have problems. 
And if you don't know what your church's problems are, knock on my door and I'll give you the list. Father <laughs> Tuft, I have a question and I know it's a new domain for me, so I'll thread lightly on it. Um, is it possible for you to comment on... Please speak a bit louder. A few, is it possible to comment on a few of the experiments that have been done in modern Greece today to resurrect some of the um, asthmatikia kolothea and the impact of this move on worship? The asthmatikia kolothea is the sung office of Hagia Sophia in Constantinople. Uh, the history of which uh, is in the process of being revised by one of the great uh, Russian Orthodox uh, uh, scholars of our, gen well, not our generation. He's young enough to be my grandson, but anyway, yeah, we're, bo we're both still alive. So this is uh, 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 Protiere Mikhail Zheltov, who's a, a good friend of, of myself, and Sister Vasa. And, uh, but uh, regardless of the, that history that is in the process of being rewritten, uh, I'm not really uh, competent to address the uh, connection of that with the iconographic issue, uh, which of course is what your Yeah, you're going to have to do some interpreting for me. I'm not. I'm not hearing well. I'm a deaf as a haddock, as I said. I so you, Father Deacon's going to have to help me. Despite the fact that I'm an art historian, the question is not about iconography. The question, um, the question is more about the possibility of intersection between research and practice. Worship and research and practice. So. Research and pastoral practice. Uh, because well, the, well the, point, the whole point of research is uh, knowing something, you see, uh, but which is not a virtue of many people. Uh, could so. I explain more what I mean? Yes. Maybe it will be better. And maybe if I come closer to yeah. you, you yeah. might hear yeah. me better. Yeah. So this is what I'm interested in. Yeah. What we are starting uh, to uncover is how physically space that is resonant has a deep, profound body effect. Yes. And so much of this research is research, is within spaces like a conference. Uh, and when I ask the question uh, about uh, uh, asthmatikia kolothea, is because there are attempts to put this research knowledge in practice in yes. Greece. Yes. And I would like to know how effective it is, how much it uh, juxtaposes or mm -hmm. defies, challenges the, I don't, the word that you use, coffee style, coffee shop style, uh, cafeteria. 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 So this is my question, because clearly I have a stake in that. I'm interested in that. Yes. And uh, in general, uh, I have always I've always said in uh, answer to the general question of the connection between uh, research and, uh, and uh, pastoral practice, or in other words, where the rubber hits the road, as we say in the vernacular, uh, I've always tried to do that as a Jesuit. Uh, St. Ignatius, who founded the Jesuits, uh, uh, used to speak of what he called uh, the purpose of all study being for the propagation of the faith. So, strictly speaking, a Jesuit who uh, follows the spirit of the founder of the order does research not to see his name in print or for the uh, you know, pleasure of his own brain cells or uh, the fame that he might uh, gather from his publication, but as a service to the church. Uh, what does that mean? That means that uh, if you really want to change things uh, or to improve them, let's say, uh, there's nothing better than knowing something. One of the problems, one of the problems of some of the pastoral efforts in uh, modern churches 
is that we have had a whole bunch of people busily engaged in the application of that which they do not possess. Uh, that is hardly helpful. So there's no substitute for knowing something if you're trying to do something or improve something. Uh, but I've always said I'm not a liturgical reformer, I'm a liturgical informer. The church belongs not to scholars, it belongs to God's representatives, the hierarchy, who have the responsibility of guiding the church. That does not mean, however, that it would not be helpful if the hierarchy had some uh, current passing between their ears. Uh, so it would be nice if they need, if they wish to change or improve something, that they might know something, uh, which, uh, with respect to my own church, I won't talk about other churches, although I could, is not always the case, of course. So that, by way of general background, so does research, does what we try to do have an actual reflection on our understanding of what uh, happens where, as they say, the rubber hits the road. In other words, where the actual, it works both ways. In other words, the kind of work that you're doing, Bisara, is extremely interesting uh, but we never know whether the effects of this uh, akolotia that you have been talking about and have shown uh, was actually intentional or whether you're discovering that it happened. And I don't know. You've got to tell me that because what you're doing, I think, is extremely interesting, but... It's like new discoveries. Uh, you have to make it up as you go along. Make it up, I don't mean the reality, but make up the explanation. Uh, and so you've got to tell us that. I can't tell you that. But is it useful for understanding actual liturgical practice? Of course it is. In other words, this was reflective of an effect on the worshiping people. Whether it was intended by those who organized it. I mean, nothing, nothing fell down from heaven like a ready-cooked pizza at the time of the apostles. Everything came from somebody, you see. Uh, but whether they actually meant or understood and intended all of the wonderful effects that actually occurred, you've got to prove. You know, you can't just uh, say, oh, sure, they must have. That's to attribute, I think, to... Uh, history, uh, something that needs to be shown by your research. But you have to tell me that. I can't tell you. You know more about it than anybody else is doing it. So you and the people that you're, you're uh, doing this extremely interesting research with, you know, have to kind of discover it step by step and dialogue with one another. I don't know if that satisfies you. Thanks, Father Tev, for a great lecture today. Um, I posed this question yesterday to Sister Vasa, and uh, I wanted to see what your take on it is. Um, we've all read the books by Father Alexander Schmemann, in which he has a, quite a negative take on symbol uh, going sometimes too far, especially in certain historical periods in Byzantine history. Yeah. And I understand that Father Schmemann may not have had the benefit of all the historical sources that have come after him. Yeah. Sorry. Right. I know what you're talking about. I'll give, uh, I'll give two answers to that. Okay. Uh, the first answer is that uh, um, Alexander Schmemann gave the uh, his uh, gave his blast uh, against basically mystagogy, in other words, the interpretation of the liturgy and the traditional sources, like Simeon of Thessalonica, whom I quoted, and uh, uh, Saint Simeon of Thessalonica, Saint Nicholas Kavasilas. Uh, he gave it at a conference on, uh, on iconography uh, at Dumbarton Oaks, uh, at which I gave a paper uh, really representing the other view, even though we, course, we didn't know that we'd be uh, at loggerheads on this. Uh, so my first answer is that uh, Dumbarton Oaks, which of course is the flagship of Byzantine studies worldwide, uh, published my pa paper. They didn't publish Schmemann's. 
Uh, uh, my second answer would be that Schmemann was wrong, simply. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Uh, I guess uh, a further question would be, do you think symbol sometimes goes a little too far? Symbols never go too far. You're not talking about symbols. You're talking about, about allegory, allegorical explanations. You have nothing to do with symbols. Read the paper of mine I was talking about, which is published in the Dumbarton Oaks uh, uh, papers, and uh, you'll get the answer to the, at least my answer to the whole business. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Father Taft, thank you for your lecture. Thank you for uh, the Q&A. Um, let's give Father Taft another hand. Truly an honor and a privilege to have you among us today. Uh, we are now, you. thank you. We are now going to take a coffee break and we will reassemble at uh, 11 a.m. For those of you who are first coming here today, just note that there is a TV display on the outside of uh, some sample icons for you to view at, at your pleasure. Reassemble at 11. Thank you. Good morning, all. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Drummond. I'm in the history department here at LMU. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to what promises to be a fascinating session on contemporary perspectives on iconography. Our first speaker today is Father John Lucas, who is a professor of art and architecture and director of the Thatcher Gallery at the University of San Francisco. He received his doctorate in theology and the arts at the Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley in 1992, and is an internationally recognized expert in Jesuit art history, as well as a well-known liturgical designer. Father Lucas's talk today is entitled, Out of the White Box and Back to Images, Post-Vatican II Iconoclasm and Beyond. Father Lucas, please. Uh, Catherine, could you please, I need to be able to see the text up here, please. No, there's a screen here that has, could you get the touch screen on for me, please? Thank you. And it's Tom, not John. Sorry. That's okay. That's fine. Thank you. Thank you very much for your welcome. It's uh, great to be here at our sister school. I teach at the University of San Francisco. Uh, today, my uh, remarks are called Out of the White Box and Back to Images, Post-Vatican II, uh, Iconoclasm and Beyond. My interest goes back a long way. Uh, this is my parish church, uh, St. Patrick's in Placerville, California. Uh, the church was built in 1865. And in 1963, uh, the church was replaced with a much larger uh, contemporary structure that my grandmother consistently referred to as that damn ski hut. <laughs> I wouldn't presume to uh, instruct this learned uh, assembly about uh, ninth century iconoclasm simply to, to hit some of the major themes that were involved in that uh, complicated uh, historical moment. Uh, there certainly was a spiritualizing and even puritanical strain that underpinned much of that, uh, whether one looks at it from the Greek Apollonian uh, uh, perspective or certainly from uh, the Hebraic traditions of, of uh, an iconic uh, worship. There certainly was an undergirding fear of suspicion, uh, uh, fear that, uh, that over-reliance on icons would uh, generate superstition. There was a fear implicit at least in the power of art, and especially in the power of popular art, of art that, uh, that reached out to ordinary people rather than the elites. Uh, there was certainly an undergirding uh, concern for the failure of the empire uh, versus Islam spread, uh, which was linked to the failure of wonder-working icons in battles. And of course, we know that the, the, the uh, conflict was finally resolved with the Second Council of Nicaea or the Seventh Ecumenical Council's uh, uh, enunciation of the theology of icons that we've spoken about uh, in, in, in uh, some detail over the last, uh, the last day or so, based on the theology of Saints John Damascene, uh, Saint Basil, and Athanasius. 
The uh, iconoclasm that uh, the Western Church experienced, uh, as was pointed out yesterday, was the iconoclasm of the Protestant Reformation. Uh, here, it's hard to see these, but this wonderful uh, graphic image shows the burning of images, the temple well purged, the ship of, uh, ship over your trinkets and be packing you papists, and papists packing away their paltry. The Reformation iconoclasm, based, as, uh, as uh, Dorian pointed out yesterday, on sola scriptura, sola fide, sola gratia, solo Christo, solo Dei Gloria, that, that confluence of solas and solos, uh, focused on a religious practice that was resolutely uh, aniconic. There's certainly the very strong Puritan strain that we find in Calvinism, starting well, well from Zwingli and forward, but Calvinism especially, and certainly a lot of this was uh, precipitated by Roman excess. Uh, here the sell selling of indulgences, which we might liken to the first carbon offset uh, uh, procedures in history. The early modern move uh, from sacred art towards aesthetics figures into this equation as well. Even as Trent re reaffirmed in its last decree the, and copied uh, the Second Council of Nicaea, the Seventh Ecumenical Council, at that same moment Renaissance humanism was fully embracing uh, pagan antiquity. And as Hans Belting puts it very well, the art of religion was becoming the religion of art. Uh, as religious uh, artists become secular artists, and as even more, uh, individual expression of the artist becomes uh, more important than the communal expression of faith that had typified art from the, from the caves up until uh, the early modern period. The Catholic response, uh, very briefly, was the Baroque, uh, which glorified and exalted in the use of images. Here, Andrea Pozzo's magnificent fresco of the uh, exaltation of the missionary activities of the Jesuits, what Cardinal Ratzinger, in his Spirit of the Liturgy, called an alleluia in visual form. Yet, the challenge and results of the Enlightenment and the revolutions of the 19th century can't be uh, overestimated. Post French Revolution, the ecclesial uh, there's a, is a period of ecclesial uh, reentrenchment, disengagement from cultural uh, discourse. There is what uh, Cardinal Ratzinger called the ghettoization of Christian faith and Christian art, a flight into historicism, a copying of the past, or else attempting. Uh, attempted compromise, losing itself in resignation and cultural abstinence. Historicism. Uh, two centuries of isms characterize uh, Catholic practice. The neoclassicism that we see in places like the Church of the Madeleine in Paris, the exuberant, uh, bizarre-like, bizarre and bizarre-like uh, neo uh, neo uh, um, neo-Romanesque version that we see in Westminster Cathedral in London, uh, the, uh, the Gothic light, if you will, of St. Patrick's Cathedral, and the Jesuit exuberance of St. Ignatius Church in San Francisco, a good example of neo-Baroque design. These isms uh, are, are repetitive, they're not creative. Uh, particularly in the United States, uh, in the situation of the immigrant church. That church is nourished uh, by, its, by the memory of what it's left behind. These isms give cultural grounding and respectability. Uh, the first cathedral in the United States was uh, constructed or was designed by Benjamin Latrobe, who was the neoclassical architect of the, of the first U.S. Capitol building. Grandeur or preciousness, preciousness of materiality implies cultural arrival for the immigrant church in the United States. And there was, as a persecu often persecuted minority, uh, the experience of insecurity, of fear of change, of hostility to the dominant culture that the church encountered here in the New World. The 19th century's uh, decorative and artistic uh, 
programs frequently demonstrate, uh, here, uh, one of Pugin's uh, chapels uh, in Britain, what, what, what uh, art historians call the horror vacui, the, this, terif- this terror at seeing any surface undecorated. <laughs> Yet even more than that, if we read Paul Ricoeur, uh, we understand that symbols uh, can get stalled or even sedimented. Uh, that symbols can, can cease to, to communicate to those who see them. Uh, there is not a, a Catholic church in the United States built between uh, 1875 and 1940 that doesn't have one of these two images in it. Uh, the, uh, the famous Sacred Heart from the Jesu in Rome or the ubiquitous plaster Immaculate Conception. If you don't believe me, go to Our Lady of Sorrows, the Jesuit parish in Santa Barbara. I stopped there on my way down, and here at the side altar, you see the horror of uh, absolutely and beautifully displayed. Uh, Saint, starting from right to left, uh, we have the, the pulpit, St. Aloysius Gonzaga, the Immaculate Conception, the Immaculate Heart of Mary above, in the washed out uh, stained glass window is the Annunciation, in the little niche is the Infant of Prague, here is St. Anthony of Padua, and over here, the new uh, and questionably uh, tasteful image of uh, divine mercy. The early 19th er, and uh, the, the 19th and early 20th century uh, often moved from uh, from art to kitsch. Kitsch as uh, as a form that degrades us by satisfying the harder mind with an ad- inadequate or false image of reality. This, and not its failure to appeal to the finer feelings of the cultivated mind, makes it an enemy to spirituality. So says Edward Robinson in Language of Mystery. Rome was cautious and authority was hesitant at the, at the beginning of the 20th century. 1912, the Archbishop of Cologne uh, declares that only neo-Romanesque and only neo-Gothic uh, styles can be used in the construction of new churches. By 1952, Rome grudgingly approves the use of modern architectural styles, but warns against controversial art that might endanger the faith and morals of the people or promote false dogmas. In 1999, uh, Pace, uh, Cardinal Ratzinger, or or Pope Benedict XVI, uh, in his uh, very er erratic speech to the uh, the, uh, artists, uh, 10 years before, he writes, uh, art itself, which is in Impressionism and Expressionism, explored the extreme possibilities of, sense, of the sense of sight, becomes literally objectless. Art turns into experimenting with self-created worlds, empty creativity, in quotes, which no longer perceives the creator's spiritus. It attempts to take, this, it take its place, yet in doing so, brings home to man the absurdity of his role as creator. Uh, as damning a, uh, a critique of contemporary and modern art as one could imagine. The liturgical movement in the, in the Western Catholic tradition in the early 20th century, largely uh, Northern European, largely monastic, largely Benedictine in its foundations, starts as an embrace of the Gothic tradition at, at uh, Solennes uh, uh, with uh, Prosper Guéranger, It sees in the later years uh, a return to the fathers and an interest, a very profound interest in orthodoxy, uh, people like Dom uh, Lambert Baudouin. Yet these uh, these movements of the liturgical movement tend to be architectonic, structural, textual rather than artistic. They focused on the reform of the liturgy of the hours, on questions of concelebration, the renewal of Holy Week, and uh, use of the vernacular. Yet their influence, the influence of these scholar monks, was deeply felt in Vatican II, especially in, the, in Vatican II's first document, uh, the Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy, uh, Sacrosanctum Concilium. We were, had some of this, uh, this uh, uh, covered yesterday, so I'm going to quickly go through here. The church has always been the friend of the fine arts, sought their noble help. The church has not adopted any particular style of art as its own, but admitted styles from every period. The art of our own days, the the council says, coming from every race and region, a nod to enculturation, shall also be given free scope in the church to add its voice to the wonderful tradition. 
Ordinaries should strive after noble simplicity rather than mere sumptuous display, a, a phrase that will be beaten to death in the decade that follows uh, the, uh, the uh, first years of the council. Uh, practice of placing sacred images where they may be venerated by the faithful is to be maintained. Nevertheless, restraint regarding their number and prominence so that they do not create confusion among the Christian people or foster religious practices of doubtful orthodoxy. Let's preserve the, the heritage that we have. In that same vein, Paul VI, who was an eminently cultural man, cultured man, establishes the uh, Vatican Collection of Contemporary Religious Art in 1973, a collection which sadly has languished since his death. Very few new additions have been made to that collection. And uh, the artists uh, that were chosen for that collection were not chosen because of their Catholic faith, but because of the quality of their work. Uh, artists like Matisse and Leger, Marc Chagall, Bonnard, Brack, Rouault, Manzu, Rothko, not daily communicants, any of them, uh, and even, even Francis Bacon made it in, because Paul VI saw that we need to be in dialogue with culture. Now, Vatican II coincided with the last moments, some would say the last gasp, of international modernism and abstract expressionism in the, f in the field of the arts. In the move from Bauhaus to modernism, we, we see the realm, some would say the tyranny, of purism and abstraction. Transparency, geometry, simplicity, new materials of steel, glass, concrete, and uh, a style that eschews all uh, all ornament, plain and simple. As Tom Wolfe puts it in his wonderfully provocative book, From Bauhaus to Our House, the lightness, the brightness, the cleanness, the bareness, and the spareness. <laughs> this purism of late modernism, as uh, Robert de Sancti says in a, in a useful book called uh, Building from Belief, it, at its most aloof and cerebral, doesn't accommodate very well the inherent messiness of that Catholic, uh, that Catholic uh, sacramentality involves. Its indulgence in layered sensuality and human emotions is not easily confinable to the truly conceptual schemes, tidy conceptual schemes of architects and liturgists. The right wing calls the decade that follows a period of renovation rather than renovation. Uh, and if you don't believe me, it's in Wikipedia, so you know it's true. <laughs> although uh, the article needs additional citations for verification. <laughs> the Sacred Congregation of the Clergy in 1971 uh, jumps on the bandwagon. It grieves the faithful to see that more than ever before there is so much unlawful transfer of ownership of historical and artistic heritage of the church. Many people have made unwarranted changes in places of worship under the pretext of carrying out the reform of the liturgy and have uh, thus caused the disfigurement and loss of precious works, priceless works of art. Cardinal Ratzinger, again, in his Spirit of the Liturgy. A new iconoclasm, iconoclasm which has frequently been regarded as virtually mandated by the Second Vatican Council. He decries that the destruction of images, the first signs of which reach back to the 1920s, parenthesis, the liturgical movement, eliminated a lot of kitsch and unworthy art, well said, but ultimately he says, left it behind and left behind it a void, a wretchedness of which we are now experiencing, we are now experiencing in a truly acute way. Stealing a line from Shakespeare, one of Shakespeare's sonnets, the uh, the decryal of bare ruined choirs. Here Gethsemane Abbey uh, in its uh, its early 60s uh, renovation and below Hard to see, unfortunately, the, the uh, great cathedral in Cuernavaca in Mexico. Bare ruin choirs, and people would say, altogether, too many felt banners. <laughs> Yet I would argue that the period from 1965 to 1975 was a period of what may be necessary iconoclasm in the Roman tradition. Uh, Many of the symbols of Roman Catholicism had become sedimented, uh, and at least for many of the aesthetic elite, and we, there are class uh, issues to be discussed here, uh, had really emptied out. Uh, so 
there was really uh, many of the symbols, like those plaster statues that, we, uh, that many of us grew up with, no longer communicated uh, uh, deeper meanings. Uh, we found ourselves in a situation where we were repeating the same formulas for more than 200 years, actually for, in, in many cases, for a thousand years without any, uh, without any forward movement. And forward movement in the West is certainly, and creativity uh, has, uh, has pride of place in the progressive uh, model. Moreover, in Vatican II, there was a new understanding of, ch of the church, not just the, 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 the church, but church buildings, uh, more as the Domus Ecclesiae, uh, as opposed to the Domus Dei, the house of the assembly, as well as the house of God. The focus moves from uh, private Eucharistic devotion, hearing mass in church, and saying one's prayers during the celebration of the Eucharist, which is in a language which one doesn't understand, the, the, the move goes from private Eucharistic devotion, understanding the church as, as the temple of the reserved sacrament, where mass is sometimes celebrated, to a communal celebration from shrine to the place of, uh, of assembly. And what the, that decade was, and one could argue that the decade went on longer than 10 years, was a, a period of extreme and sometimes reckless, uh, admittedly reckless er experimentation. Yet, I would argue that the bare ruin choirs aren't so bare anymore. If we look at St. Mary's Cathedral in San Francisco with its spectacular windows and its uh, stunning baldacchino by uh, Richard Lippold, uh, we see a, 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 a resolutely modern space which over the past 20 years has been completed with the addition of six monumental bronzes uh, showing the life of the Blessed Virgin from uh, Manfredini, uh, Ercole uh, Manfredini, uh, who was an, an Italian sculptor in his school. The new Cathedral of Christ the Light in Oakland, uh, the, the uh, altar wall behind the main altar is a remarkably produced uh, reinterpretation of uh, Christ uh, from the, the facade of Chartres Cathedral, done uh, with a, a pixelated glass screen of tremendous subtlety, seen here uh, from inside the cathedral above the, the high altar on the left, and this ghostly, wonderful image on a foggy night in downtown Oakland on, uh, on your right, I should say. Uh, elegant, small devotional spaces uh, surrounding the body, the great open nave space of the cathedral in Oakland uh, provide spaces for, for very traditional art, uh, some very fine uh, Latin American uh, devotional art and some contemporary art as well. Our own, uh, here, for those of you who are Angelinos, uh, the cathedral of, uh, of Our Lady of the Angels, uh, a, an architectural lump from the outside Rafael Muneo's uh, attempt at adobe. Uh, <laughs> yet, a cathedral that, that uh, interacts remarkably with the urban scene as it sits atop the Hollywood freeway. And what saves this cathedral is, I, at least in my opinion, is the art that it contains, from the glass screen of the angels along the freeway to John Nava's remarkable uh, series of, uh, of tapestries, 10 feet tall, there are 25 tapestries, that have 135 uh, saints that march in procession towards the altar. They save this from being one more modernist uh, barn and turn it into a, a vivid place of worship, at least in, in, as I see it. What's even more remarkable is that Nava went out and found faces of the people of Los Angeles for, and photographed them and turned them into these images of saints for whom we don't have a, an accurate visual, uh, visual uh, reference. The great doors of the cathedral, uh, <clears throat> here shown at the, at the funeral of, uh, of uh, Robert Graham, the artist who designed 35 foot tall bronze doors that incorporate the traditional imagery of, uh, of the apparitions of Our Lady in a very contemporary key as one walks into this long ambulatory before entering the cathedral. And uh, I think most remarkably, the, the truly iconic image of uh, the Blessed Virgin as, as the mother of the new, of, of the new world of, of many cultures that stands above the door. The woman clothed in the sun reinterpreted in a very modern way. 
Many people see in postmodernism the remedy uh, to, uh, to the simplicity of, of uh, recent years, yet I have to ask if it isn't perhaps a false friend. Uh, certainly, it helps us to escape from the white box. Uh, it helps us uh, with the return to ornament, although ornament is not always well understood. It's ornament for the sake of ornament rather than ornament for a purpose. The question I have is, is it too facile? Uh, is it a simplistic quick fix rather than encouraging artists and architects to create a truly new Roman Catholic vernacular? Is it the irony of whatever uh, appropriate for church building? Just very quickly, a few examples of postmodernist church building. St. Michael's in Wheaton. Uh, when in doubt, throw in some pointed arches and everybody be, will be happy. Or, even better, let's go back to the Romanesque, St. John Neumann Church in Farragut, Tennessee, which looks like it could have been built in 1950. This is a, a building that was dedicated about seven years ago. Uh, even more so, St. Paul's outside of Columbus, Ohio, stencil work gone crazy, and an interior complete with the fresco uh, behind the altar of, uh, that could have come out of a 1950s catechism. Uh, with the, the exception of, of the altar being pulled forward, uh, really there is nothing that speaks to uh, anything but, uh, but the past. Yesterday, uh, during Father Alexi's speech, or talk, uh, he was talking about what, in, in different language, uh, how we as sophisticated consumers of images uh, uh, have to approach uh, religious art. And Ricoeur, again, speaks of the need for a second naivete, that we have to get through all of our critical senses and then be able to move back into living with our eyes open. And Pache, dear Father Taft, uh, maybe there is something better than knowing something, and maybe that's loving something. And uh, I think that the place where we can learn this is if we ask the Holy Spirit for the gift of humility to be silent as the simple or silent before beauty that's ever ancient and ever new. Uh, and I think a place for us to look, uh, as, as Californians at least, is to the images of Guadalupe, uh, which seem vulgar to many, yet which uh, enliven churches like St. Mary's Cathedral. There are three separate shrines to Our Lady of Guadalupe at Our Lady of the Angels, no surprise. This chapel that I was able to, to design for St. Ignatius Church in San Francisco. Something ancient and something new put together. The challenge for us is to reinterpret ancient symbols and to, to let them speak in a, a contemporary language. And perhaps most of all, the challenge is to bring together the fractured face of Christ um, and restore the unity of the church. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, Father Tom Lucas. Sorry about that. Um, our next speaker is Professor Richard Schneider, who is a visiting professor of iconology and advanced hermeneutics at St. Vladimir's Orthodox Theological Seminary in Crestwood, New York, and adjunct professor and director of Orthodox East Christian Studies in the Faculty of Divinity at Trinity College, University of Toronto. He is also Professor Emeritus of Church History and Medieval History at York University in Toronto, uh, and of note for this gathering, he was the first Orthodox president of the Canadian Council of Churches, and the last. Um, not that he's the last forever, one would hope. Uh, Professor Schneider is speaking on, is innovation in iconography orthodox? Professor Schneider? I don't know. As you can tell, I've got a very huge topic here, uh, one, one about which there is infinite debate and a very short amount of time to talk about it. So th this is going to go rather lickety-split, I'm afraid. 
Um, therefore, uh, I'm giving, giving you the, some of the texts that I'm going to bring into the argument so that you could take this home and ponder them for yourselves as they kind of flash by here. <clears throat> so as, as, you, as you see, um, there is uh, a considerable argument on several sides of the question about uh, whether inno innovation is a possibility, um, especially in orthodox iconography, but uh, in general as a concept in orthodoxy. Um, can we talk about innovation? And it's immediately a red flag to a bull, uh, al along with its companion phrase, development of doctrine. Okay. Uh, is that better? Yes. Okay, uh, along with its companion phrase, development of doctrine. Um, if we're going to use such terms, obviously they're going to need very careful definition. Uh, what would be innovation? And I will tell you uh, right now what my answer is in the thesis of this talk, which is that in innovation is inherent in orthodoxy. Um, we, you can't live without it. I'm going to show you why. Uh, it's inherent in the very nature of man as the image of God. And if you're not committed to innovation, uh, you probably didn't understand Father Taft's talk. Um, however, Father Taft also emphasized the criterion of anything is good as long as it leads you to God and is, and is orthodox. Um, so there's that last criterion too. Uh, we also heard in Father Tom's talk just a minute ago um, that there has to be discernment of spirits. Um, are, we, are we able to recognize a useful innovation, a good innovation, and an insightful innovation as opposed to something which is just egotistical or, or is leading us astray? Um, uh, so therefore, in this talk, I will, de I will deal very superficially with these five questions. Um, these, are the point, these are the points of the talk. Um, whether innovation is permissible, um, if, if it, what would motivate innovation if one were orthodox? Um, what do we have to do about innovations which challenge us, which test our limits? Um, what do we do with innovations that absolutely break the limits? And finally, the theological implications of what we've been talking about. Um, here you have uh, an example of what would be a very common opinion uh, in orthodoxy. Uh, it's by Leni Duspensky, uh, although Father Bob was, Father Taft was absolutely right yesterday. The ideas in it all come from uh, Florensky. Um, yeah, but uh, they were made canonical, if I may put it ironically, by Uspensky. And uh, you, would, you would find ideas of this kind uh, repeated in dozens and dozens and dozens of books written in the 20th century, in, in very, very much the same kind of words. Okay. Um, what's more of a surprise, perhaps, it, it's almost surprising that Uspensky says such things although I think he was more concerned with the revival of um, what he thought of as medieval or Byzantine, what, what was actually 15th century Russian style, um, and in general the rise of the, Byzant of the revival of the Byzantine against what was then going on in Russia. But there's a lot of East-West bashing in it also, quite clearly, and we'll deal with that a little later in the talk. <coughs> um, but Uspensky was quite a good painter, and, and it's really quite remarkable that he can say things like this, because it's all of this is denied by actually looking at the works. Um, what's perhaps more remarkable than that, though, is the way when art historians try to pick up on what are what icons are and how they 
operate and what's unique or different about an icon, um, we get something like this. And you notice that the date is just a couple of years ago, just five years ago. And it's by one of the finest Bi Byzantine art historians uh, in the world. Um, <clears throat> So there is this idea of canonicity coming in there, uh, that, that orthodoxy has a canon of iconography, and somehow innovation would have to work against that canon, uh, since that's partly the thesis of Maguire's book. Uh, he has a, perhaps a vested interest in uh, def defending that case. Uh, it's rather important for us to remember that those canons don't exist. Um, there are Dogmas about the theology of icons, oh yes, lots and lots of that. And we have to operate within that understanding of iconography. Um, canons, that is to say legal prescriptions about what's appropriate in iconography, you can count them pretty much on one hand. And what's more, none of them really gets followed as we will see. Uh, things can get even worse, you can turn it into a kind of Neoplatonic um, notion of creativity in iconography, that iconography somehow drops out of the sky. Uh, this too is from a very well-known art historical book. Um, again, one that's rather surprising. Uh, the, the argument of the book is that there was a basic program that uh, occupied the middle Byzantine church. You, you heard the program from Father Taft. Uh, in point of fact, the three big churches on which this theory was based are as different from each other as night and day. There's an, under, there's an underlying structure, a, a sense of taxes, what Father Bob was talking about, that make, brings them into commonality. But then their particular creativity with regard to that taxes is innovative. Each one is different. This, on the other hand, is written by a contemporary iconographer, Stamatis Clearis, and <coughs> uh, expresses exactly the opposite reading. And I think that's very interesting because this, this is coming from somebody who really spends his time looking. And what he, what he talks about is the all-pervasiveness of innovation in Byzantine art. Um, He's distinguishing real Byzantine art, living when it was a living art, from the kind of uh, paying obeisance copying of the style that is regarded today as the only way to be canonical, partly thanks to Uspensky. <coughs> so we come now to the question of if we're going to argue that innovation is all pervasive, uh, what is it as a phenomenon and what is motivating or causing it? So we'll start with this one, uh, an icon uh, which we heard from Father Cherovsky yesterday has become universally attractive. Uh, you can find this icon in churches of many, many persuasions. Um, and as Father Sierowski pointed out, nobody's quite sure why, but everybody likes it. Um, for the, so we have to examine it in a little more um, thoughtful spirit and remember that this thing is an innovation. It's an innovation even as a technology because it's a panel icon. It comes from the 6th century, and it's just around then that panel, icon, panel icons start. Before that, iconography is mural iconography on the walls. Um, why does panel iconography develop? It's in conjunction with the development of complexity in the liturgy. Panel iconography is movable and therefore uh, can function for all these movable dimensions of liturgical practice such as the rise of a liturgical calendar and processions as we heard yesterday. All right. um, the image is innovative. Uh, it's innovative at several levels. Um, it's a good example of realism, but at the same time, the realism is controlled. The realism is made symbolic. 
by the treatment of the face and so on. I could, I, one could go on analyzing this object for quite a long time. Um, <clears throat> I'll, I'll leave it at the two halves of the face um, reflect the discussion, the um, very ferocious discussion that was going on immediately after the Council of Chalcedon about the two natures of Christ. Uh, before we leave the slide, please note there are no inscriptions on it. Right. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, Father Bob wants the rubber to hit the road. <laughs> Here it is. This is the rubber hitting the road. Uh, where does innovation come from? Could I have a sip of water, please? Yes. Uh, where, does, where does innovation really come from? Right. And what makes, what makes it inherent or fundamental? Um, this passage, in some ways, sums up the whole story. And what you want to notice is that the vocabulary in it is about form. Right. So the passage, is, the passage is talking about conversion, um, understanding things in a new way, but it uses form as its basis for making that clear. And the, the vocabulary in Greek is even more clear because it plays with all these various words, uh, all of which are various synonyms of ikon. Uh, so schema, so morphe. Um, you can't find a better passage, but you'll note that at the end of the passage, what si changing your form does is give you understanding. If you grasp things in a different and new way. Uh, the most important passage, that go, there are two important passages that go with it, which I will leave to you for homework. Um, Ephesians 1.18, where the eyes of your mind, a body in form, the eyes of your heart, and particularly Philippians 2, the great canonic hymn, uh, which is all based not on a morality of emptying out, it's all based on changing forms changing what you look like. Um, to carry on with this discussion, uh, we have to go through a few simple basics of how icons work, how creativity in icons work. And we can't spend a long time on this, but here are the fun three most fundamental principles of iconographic design. Uh, you can see them very much, very much at work in this image of the ascension. So high degree of order. We can recognize the various figures, um, symmetry, and um, in short, it's re readable as the ascension. And in it, we can recognize uh, what the scriptures are telling us about the story of the ascension in words. Um, then these get nuanced by a bunch of further criteria, uh, all of which contribute to innovation. So the three basic criteria, you, you can't do without them. They're, they're fundamental to the iconographic language. These are what creative artists play with in order to give that quality of um, singular expression to their particular version of a statement about a truth in the great tradition. Um, and here's as good an example of that as I can show you in that <clears throat> um, if, you, if you want to somehow express the saintliness of a bishop, this is St. Nicholas, um, you make him into the image of the Pantocrator Christ. And that, so that figure is used for bishops. Um, hieratic and narrative is shown in this absolute image in the center with a narrative, a vita, around the outside. And this, by the way, is an innovation also. It's an innovation of the 13th century. It was begun as Mount Sinai. It has the first five of these icons. They were probably made as a set. They're all the same size. Um, but somebody using the ideas, the basic language of 
iconology, was able to have an innovative notion of how to present the hagiography, the saintliness of a saint, and show that all saints are types of Christ. <clears throat> um, leave, leaving this point somewhat reluctantly, uh, I'll leave you with this exceedingly brilliant icon. This is one of my favorite objects in the world uh, because it so illustrates the kind of seeing that is necessary. So you notice this is St. Luke painting that image, the Hodigetria, that supposedly was painted by St. Luke. We'll come back to that in a second. Um, but his model is the Virgin standing as the Virgin of the sign. So his artistic imagination has translated what he sees with the eyes of his body into what he needs to express with the eyes of his mind. And it's a justification piece for that particular icon. It's absolutely wonderful. This kind of seeing is, by the way, distinguished in scripture as theorein, theorein, modern Greek. Um, that is, you don't just see, you see with understanding. There are, other, there are seven other verbs for seeing. They're all about just seeing stuff. But theorein is when you can see like John the theologian. What Jesus tells us to, is the way to see him. Uh, the apostles don't manage to pull that off even at Emmaus. <clears throat> um, uh, this is, I, I'm putting this up here simply as an, now we're, we're talking about various motivations. I'll, I'll just rattle off five kinds of motivations. Um, I'm putting this up as an example of a motivation prompted by theological discourse. So this icon, it's contemporary piece with the famous Christ Pantocrata is created right after Council of Ephesus. So it's contemporary theological discourse that is pushing the existence of this object. By the way, we talked about chairs yesterday. A chair is a perfect example of iconological talk. Why chairs? It's a rhetorical synecdoche, and to be sitting on a chair is to be in a position of honor. So she's sitting on a chair. Um, here's an innovation. Deus, it's not the deuses. Deuses is an old, old tradition. And good innovation plays off of tradition. But what's different here, right, is putting a bishop's mitre on Christ's head. This is a further statement. It's an insight. It suggests uh, perhaps reading of Hebrews that Christ is the example of the great high priest. And so you can just make that next step, that next innovative step. It's going on all the time. And by the way, notice this is in a period that's supposed to be not very theologically profound. But the iconographic language is a place that Orthodox have always understood as a place of innovation, always. Um, and this manuscript from Iveron is quite fascinating because it plays with that idea. Um, in that, in the opening, fat, the opening illustration, the opening headpiece, Christ is wearing the crown of the bishop, whereas at the beginning of Saint Basil's liturgy, Saint Basil is presented without his mitre, head, you know, bareheaded. I think that's a wonderful play. Um, patronage pushes innovation. Patrons want things. Now, the idea of a, this is from the Chora church, and the idea of a kneeling patron at Christ's feet is not news, it's the old tradition. But that that patron should be wearing his entire court regalia to show what an important official he is at court, that's an innovation. And it went into this very, very important church, and nobody blinked an eye. Um, now, um, a word or two about rhetoric, and then we'll come to the conclusion. Um, one of the most significant breakthroughs theologically and artistically ever is seen in the development of this iconography in the 12th century. Um, so if this type, the Hodigetria, right, is regarded as a kind of standard, although in point of fact it's a development of the 11th century, right, um, what's so significant about this? Look at the composition. Look at the play on those basic elements of composition. And suddenly, God touches man. 
And it's done by simply making the two faces with one single line. And you get an entirely new human anthropology out of this. It's a profound insight. And it's expressed most powerfully in art. There'd be an intersection with the words that would be expressing the same kinds of ideas, Simeon the New Theologian and so on. But the, this one little change right, is absolutely an orthodox insight and carries all kinds of weight. Uh, let's I'm just reminding you that the Hodigetria is also an innovation. It's a, it's a recensional variation of the earlier iconography. Um, and it's also a good example of reaction to culture. The icon is named for the place that it was in. Um, so the impact of rhetoric in iconography uh, is also very profound and is a great motivator of innovation. Um, iconography is rhetorical. Orthodoxy is rhetorical. Orthodoxy is a missionary outreach preaching religion. Right? And therefore, rhetoric is absolutely necessary. Most of the fathers were rhetoricians. So we look at something like this. Um, again, a development of the late 11th and 12th century, this iconography. And <coughs> um, we could talk about emotion in it, but it is in fact rhetoric. And you can actually see what's happened. It's this, this iconography tilted, ni tilted 90 degrees. But the result is a powerful statement. It's the only icon in which Christ is horizontal. The only icon in which Christ is horizontal. It's a very powerful statement. He should be the vertical central axis. Um, so these are the tools with which rhetoric works. Okay. Um, you can see it working very successfully in this 14th century variant on this earlier recension in that we saw this as high taxes. Look what's happened. The mother of God turns sideways. Just that little change, right, suddenly makes the lower register totally narrative and builds the excitement. But even more of a mystery is the fact that Christ is sitting on a throne, but there's no throne. He's sitting, but it's empty air. Quite an amazing thing. Brilliant innovation. Really insightful. Um, theology exegesis can drive innovation it's the last of my points um, so here we have the presentation of the mother of God in the temple and she's climbing the stairs and all that standard recension but boom at the top of the stairs is the annunciation set off by itself as an icon within the icon so that's the eschaton of her presentation in the temple absolutely theological, is brilliant, and look what data it comes from. Um, you can see that by comparison to this 14th century predecessor, where this standard narrative is what we get, and you can see how closely the exegetical work has been happening, because in the standard narrative, when she gets up there, she's fed by an angel. Oh, what's the enunciation? It's the two figures of an angel and the mother of God. So, um, therefore, innovation, real innovation is theological creativity. It has nothing to do with style, nothing. Style is culture. There's only one difference between these two images, right? despite their stylistic difference, and the difference is her folded hands, which is a Western figure, not, a, not an Eastern. Easterners don't pray like that. Okay. Um, so we have acculturation, big deal. Right. Um, the same for this. Iconographically, they're identical. Um, style can become rather a uh, cultus in its own. The question was raised yesterday about whether we can turn churches into museums. Uh, this is the rebuilding of Christ the Savior in Moscow. I think it makes the point. Um, and now we're into the last point, which is about can we tell good, that borderline innovation and how do we discern the spirits? 
So if we look at the one on the right, right, it's a New Testament trinity. Right? Those who are against innovation in orthodoxy would say, in orthodox iconography would say, this is horrible. This is Western. As Uspensky says it over and over again. Right? This is absolutely Western. Well, I suspect this is the, the commonest icon outside of the Mother of God in the whole Orthodox world. It's on its mural, so you can't even put it in the basement. It's there on the walls. And people are praying in front of it constantly. Right? It's borrowed from the West, sure it is, in the, back in the 14th century. The Russians in the 17th century painted the Nicene Creed with this image looking over it. Now there's a council with canons against it. Stoglov Council, a so-called hundred chapter, says don't do it, right? At which point they started doing it by the hundreds. <laughs> That's about canons. This, however, right? A seraph crucified is to crucify a metaphor. And that's probably over the line. What about this? This is by Stomatis Fluidis. Okay. And other images like this have been in a church. Now he's, he's painting a metaphor too. This is a metaphor. St. Nicholas the Steersman is the name of the icon. He comes from hagiography. But it's within the recensional tradition. The story is in the medieval hagiography of St. Nicholas. The boat is right there. Okay. It's just Sclerus has made a frontal image, a hieratic image, and put in that wheel to make the point. Anything wrong with that? Is it anti-iconographic? The real criterion is use. Use and function. Can you put it on the analogian and do a reverence in front of it. Will it induce you to pray? Father Bob's criteria this morning. Right? That's the basic issue. We heard yesterday about using photographs as icons. Why not? Medium is not the issue. Uh, icons, Uspensky says it's only a real icon if you paint it in uh, egg tempera on gesso panel. It's baloney. We talked yesterday about three dimensions and two dimensions. There are icons in every dimension and in every possible medium, beaten copper, mosaic, take your pick, carved ivory. Right. Those aren't the issues. Icon just means the image. It has to do with your relationship to it. Uh, the one on the left is used as the icon of uh, Emmaus House in New York, uh, Madonna House in New York. The one on the right, what do we make of that background? Certainly not traditional but it links the resurrection with creation. It would make a theology out of it. On the other hand, one would say it's the Western anastasis, the Western resurrection. Sure it is. Uh, there's an image of that big as life in the Serbian cathedral in Budapest on the east wall of the apse. But then there's that which is obviously over the line. Right? And that's innovation being done for ideological purposes. I don't have to say anything about these. Um, I didn't put in here the recent icon commissioned by an Australian bishop against abortion. It's simply too pornographic to include. But there is this also commissioned by a bishop. And that was, this is the icon of the World Cup that was recently held in Western Ukraine. Commissioned by a bishop. He was the patron. So we end with the last quotation on your sheet, again by the great Stomatis Clearis. And it's the exactly for him the freedom of innovation right, that causes theological authenticity. Slavish copy is done by slaves. We won't discourse on this, but the point is that interaction from the Romans between you and the icon. Uh, I do have to say that Windows is completely a false image. It was invented by Florensky, as far as I can make out. Uh, doesn't occur before that. 
Um, it's not medieval talk or patristic talk. Patristic talk is about mirrors. It's all about mirrors. So when you're looking at this icon, you are looking at a mirror, a mirror of yourself. If anybody wants text, I can supply you a do baker's dozen. So, the issue is not innovation or not innovation. The issue is whether we can read it with our eyes of faith, with theoria. The issue is whether we can recognize, first of all, our own image in it. We're all in a big hotel with huge mirrors. When you see, look in those mirrors, do you see yourself? And, whoa, I'm sorry. And um, the next... The, the theosis step is whether you can look at the person sitting next to you. Oh, went back to the beginning. Yeah. The issue is whether you can see the person next to you and see that. the speakers, we're actually going to move directly into the question and answer period because we figured that there was a lot to talk about and so we'd like to get a conversation going. Uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with the process here. We've got microphones at both ends. I'll alternate as much as possible, but if there's a line forming up at one, um, we'll keep going in that direction. And we'll start over here on the left. If uh, for both of you, thanks for your wonderful talks. Um, if, in fact, icon means image, okay, I'd like for you to comment on uh, my very limited understanding. Maybe you can help make it better. Being made in the image of God and how that corresponds to iconography and how that corresponds to our understanding of what that means to be created in the image of God. Uh, let's see, does anybody want lunch? Um, <laughs> let us begin at the beginning, literally, right? Um, creating the man in the image of God is the only creation God thinks about. And it's the only, image, the only step in creation that God stops to think about. And the text is quite explicit and quite mysterious, right? He says, let us, con let us create humankind in our image, right? And it specifies male and female. It goes out of its way to specify that. Now, that's intended to tell us, right, that what we are encountering, right, when we encounter image, right, is the data for our knowledge of God. And what it tells us that what we're encountering when we encounter each other right, requires everything we know about God in order to understand that encounter. Um, if Father Bob will permit me to exegete him, <laughs> uh, I know him rather well. And when he says scholarships about knowing something, he's actually talking about... right that most fundamental theology of the heart. It's, about, it's, it's what we were saying here about seeing with recognition. And so, fundamentally, that's what image is. Right? Um, when you use the word icon, icon to refer to a kind of object, uh, you're actually going through the very complex philology of that word. It's icon in Greek, it's figura in Latin. And at the base meaning of that, it's, all, it's just about recognition. Right? Uh, somebody gives me a photograph of my blessed grandmother at the age of 60, I can recognize her. Right? Uh, so it's about recognition at, at a baseline. But immediately, that came to mean recognizing the form. I can recognize my grandmother as a woman. Right? That's more like recognizing the form. And then came the Christian Revolution, and it was recognizing that all forms are connected. And that's how typology develops. 
That's why the Abraham, you know, preparing to slaughter Isaac becomes a type of the crucifixion. So icon carries that theological meaning. And it's only at the most elementary level that it applies to an object that carries an image. That is the name. And if you're going to apply it to an object that carries the image, uh, you cannot stop at panel paintings, which are the uh, most reduced form of iconography. As I said, the mural iconography is the key, to, the key to the program. And it has to apply to the reliquaries and to um, uh, you know, the, the sculptures in the church and the ivory that's on the book cover and the book cover itself, which you kiss, and on and on and on and on and on. Um, and I notice uh, that you are wearing a cross, right? And so we've got them on our persons, too. Uh, Orthodox get this cross in baptism. It's the only Orthodox cross that doesn't have a body of Christ on it. And why does it not have the body of Christ on it? Because you're the body of Christ on it. And so our, Im our being the image of God is simply mimetic of Christ himself because we are told in scripture that he is the image of the living God. That's how, that's how image works. Yeah, I would simply add to that uh, the, uh, the recognition also, I, I think, is always uh, bound up with the incarnation as well. Uh, the word becomes flesh, the word becomes visible. Uh, and that's why in uh, the Catholic tradition, in its broadest extension, East and West, has always, uh, has always used images because we understand we, we need to see with our eyes what we've heard with our ears. Because we learn, what do we, how do we learn? We learn 90% of what we learn comes through our eyes, doesn't it? Uh, so it's recognition of, of Christ as the image of the unseen God and then, as you say very, very elegantly, uh, being able to look into the face of the person next to, to yourself and then see that mirrored back to you. So it's always incarnational, as I see it. By the way, that was a very good example of innovation because it was an utterly 20th century psychological speech, but at its heart were two quotations from John of Damascus. Thank you. Thank you. So <laughs> that's, that's how it works. Dorian? You. Uh, this is a question for Father Lucas. Um, you mentioned the question of class and taste. Um, one of the things that I, I think is operating very much uh, since Vatican II within Catholic theology is the question of culture. You've also mentioned acculturation. Uh, here in Los Angeles, Mass is celebrated in, I forget how many different languages, it's something like 37 different languages, if not more, maybe 137. On a Sunday, uh, we're the most ethnically diverse city in the history of the world. Uh, could you talk, please, uh, about the, the imp uh, implications of culture, uh, particularly ethnic culture, uh, in questions of uh, religious imagery? I used uh, Guadalupe as, an, as kind of the, the or example for us Californians, but uh, I think the, if, if you go to any parish church, especially the big white boxes, uh, where there's a, a vivid community, uh, you'll find somewhere in some corner color. You'll find Our Lady, uh, or the, the Santo Nino, you'll find uh, the local uh, saint, the, you'll find the local Madonna, which makes that place, which is a, a, a neutral place, it makes that place home. And that's certainly why the multiplication of multiple images happen uh, sometimes to excess. I mean, there's no question that sometimes we get carried away with this and we can end up uh, looking like a, a bad religious goods uh, uh, magazine uh, or catalog. Yet, I think it's, it's profoundly important for us to recognize that the vitality of the church isn't necessarily coming Pace, out of the Vatican, but it's coming out of the lived experience of the faith. And what people bring with their religious experience is the whole furniture that they were raised with. Uh, it's why Vatican II was such a, a trauma for so many people. Uh, for my grandmother, you know, that damn ski hut. Uh, because she was used to worshiping in an Irish slash German church with wonderful Munich windows in it. And uh, it, it, was, it was reduced without her, without her uh, uh, say so. So I guess I would say that, that 
my hope for the church is that we're not afraid to allow the richness of other traditions to come in and to change how we see things. We have to sing different songs. We have to move in different ways. We have to accommodate uh, within obvious reason uh, to the, the lived experience. Of, and I think that's going to make, the, that's going to give the church vitality the, the, and the kind of vitality that many felt, and I think to a, a large extent uh, correctly, was sapped out by the, the modernist revival or the modernist uh, change in, in the early uh, 70s. <clears throat> Our fabulous chairman was giving me threatening letters, so I rather I rather I rather skimped the uh, discussion of style, uh, which could go on and on and on, but style is where um, the iconographic tradition encounters culture, and it's exactly the analog to um, translation of the scriptures, to preaching in the local language, to hearing the liturgy in one's living language instead of an old archaic language. It's all of those things. Um, it's been the genius of orthodoxy, or was the genius of orthodoxy for a very long time. Think of Cyril and Methodius with the Slavs. Um, think of the Japanese mission and so on and so on. The, the Alaskan mission is a particularly good example. Um, it's vitally important. Um, it, my favorite example, I didn't bring it along to show you, uh, two students of mine both painted icons of Mother Olga, who is a Yupik Indian, and um, one of them is a traditionalist, and so she painted Mother Olga to look like a Russian babushka. <laughs> the other one went and lived in the village for a year, and her, not only is her Mother Olga absolutely ethnically Yupik, right, carrying as her attributes the things that she would have used as a midwife, uh, but the heavenly light, which in iconography is normally depicted either in solid blue or in solid gold, the heavenly light is in this icon depicted as the northern lights of northern Canada. So it's, you know, baptizing the place, Matthew 28, right? Uh, 26, right? So, um, you know, the sensitivity to culture is vital to the success of the gospel. There is no gospel without culture. There's only one thing everybody in the world shares. Jesus Christ really died and risen, right? And therefore, we have hope of salvation. All the rest is exegesis. All the rest is culture. Has to be. We live in culture. In uh, Temple Beth Israel in San Francisco, there's a stained glass window, and it shows Moses striking the rock in the desert, except the rock is El Capitan in, in Yosemite. <laughs> Over here on the left, please. We heard from Johan in the first day several uh, comments about uh, iconography uh, and theology, liturgy, not limited by media or style. And today, Father Robert challenged us with a question of liturgy being always past, present, and future. And he reiterated this, underlined this, he used the phrase, and he qualified the phrase, representation as re-presentation. This is similar to the way that um, Alexander Nagel and Christopher Wood have set forth their book, Anachronic Renaissance. It's an idea of renewal. So the question is, we've talked about past and present. The question now is iconography and future. We heard from Sister Vasa yesterday discussion about questions of liturgical renewal, and we had those challenging five questions from Johann on the first day. So the question is, for both of you, what would you say the task in the sense of what Father Robert has said about uh, primarily liturgy always being past, present, and future, but iconography, past, present, and future, emphasize the, the future aspect of iconography. Ever ancient, ever new. Uh, Augustine nailed it, uh, and that's the challenge for us. Uh, we have to be like the, uh, the good housewife in, uh, in the scriptures 
who goes into the into the closet and uh, and pulls out uh, old things and new things. Uh, we have to be like the nuns in Mexico when the bishop came uh, for dinner and they had nothing to feed him. They they sh the the good sister invented mole, which is one of the great uh, inventions of the Western world. Because what did she have? She had a chicken, she had some chocolate, and she had some chilies. Well, that's an unlikely combination now, isn't it? But she took ancient things and made something new out of them. And I think that's really the challenge for us as people of, of vision. Uh, renewal means making new things all over again, as our ancestors did, just as we are representing the tradition. Well, we're renewing the tradition if we're going to keep, if the, if, the, if the tradition is going to live. Uh, otherwise, we, we're, we're creating artifacts for uh, an ecclesiastical museum. Uh, rather, I think we need to constantly keep our eyes open. And we have to be careful about this, and we have to make some big, stupid mistakes. We have to be willing to make big, stupid mistakes, which is some of uh, the, and I didn't show you the most ghastly uh, uh, mistakes of the 70s and 80s in the Catholic tradition, but you've all, or really many of you have a, a sense of this. But without making those mistakes, we don't learn. We get, we get, we close ourselves into uh, an old newel rather than a renewal. So I, I think that the, it's uh, reaching into the closet and pulling out all the pieces and examining them and lo looking at them lovingly and then saying, hmm. I mean, that's where the, those, those images, the last two images I showed were from an exhibit that we're doing at USF right now. And uh, some people would find them distru uh, disturbing images, the Sacred Heart. Uh, that's made from a piece of tree trunk dipped in, it's, it's a modern encaustic piece, fragmenting the, the, that, the, the beloved icon of, uh, of Jesus from Sinai, uh, speaks to my students at least because they understand what that fragmentation is about. And they have to recreate Christ for themselves. It's not something that's simply given to them. So it's constantly uh, renewing what, uh, what the, the the riches, and we have to look back and respect the, the, the depths of the tradition. <clears throat> I would just simply uh, second every word of that. Uh, it's very important to remember, uh, we tend to associate reform with the upheaval and the disruption and the new broom and all that stuff. Uh, reform is an old word in the church, and it's fundamental. It's exactly that metamorphosis of Romans 12, mm -hmm. uh, in Latin, re formatio, creating the form again, but re means you're not inventing something new. It means you're re-establishing the form that should be. So it always has to be in dialogue with tradition. It can never be the slave of tradition. As to what the future looks like, um, uh, first of all, that's absolutely against my rules. I'm a historian. I'm not, I'm not allowed to tell you what the future is like. But um, I, I can tell you one thing about the future. Um, and the, that's in three words, and the three words are education, education, and education. And if we don't do that, we won't have a church in the future. That's for sure. Um, my students all say, you know, when they take a course in something like this, and they all say, wait a minute, aren't we creating a two-tier church here, an elite who knows this stuff, and simple pious? And I say, absolutely not. You're all going to be priests, right? Um, the most common form of preaching in the early church is what's called ekphrastic preaching. Ekphrastic preaching is when you create an image. There's either one actually there, or you make a picture of one in the minds of your hearers, and you preach from it. Go and look. Basil, Chrysostom, right? Gregory of Nazianzus, all of them preach that way. Preach in figures. It's the, also the way you're taught to remember anything is in figures. You can teach this stuff to people. I, I do it all the time. Father? I want to continue on this uh, same theme and, and, and return to some things that, that have been said. Uh, I really appreciate what Father Lucas said about uh, the need to make mistakes. Um, because um, it, when we make the mistakes, sometimes we realize, okay, that's not where we want to go. Um, and that helps us to clarify our path. Um, it brings us back uh, onto the, the, 
the living path. Okay, so um, my question is um, with regard to uh, style being, you know, encountering the culture and, and all of that. Today, not talking about the future, talking about today. Remember yesterday I made the little uh, offhanded comment about uh, we're, we're living in a post-Protestant civilization, if it is a civilization. Uh, that, of course, was a snotty remark. Uh, but uh, what, what is, uh, can you give us some examples, and I realize you don't have, you can't just you know, pull them out of a hat, uh, and we'd like to see them visually, but both of you, are good at describing things that our mind's eye uh, could see. Now, uh, I appreciate the, the presentation of the, that Christ of Sinai. That, that, that is an example. Uh, could you give us other examples of uh, how an icon um, spoke to today without becoming kitsch, without you know, being trite? You know, like uh, our, our Lady of uh, Ground Zero. And you have the Mother of God, and you have the two towers with planes flying into them. And it, it, somehow that, that makes, to me, it trivializes, it makes it trite. And, it, and it's, it winds up as kitsch. What speaks to today? Can you give us some examples? That's what I'm hoping for. Well, first of all, Father, I think that if we... Okay, let's go back to a couple of examples, one of which you saw in the talk, and I'm quite sure you and your wife picked this up, that in one of those uh, Ukrainian deuses scenes, uh, the Mother of God, instead of, instead of her traditional uh, hymatian, was wearing an absolutely gorgeous piece of Ukrainian embroidery. Did you see that? Yeah. I mean, uh, that's a kind of care for the culture, a notion that the culture could be baptized. An Anglican priest, very good friend of mine, um, tossed out the traditional Christmas creche that was on the big front of their church and had an artist student in his uh, congregation design one in which all the, pe all the people in the creche were people from various walks of Toronto. Um, all right, so that, that's a kind of literal, literal level of just in incorporating the visual scene uh, into iconography as long as it is meaningful, as long as the basic language is still there, the message is still there, uh, as long as the connection with recension can be seen. Um, but there's no universal solution. This crash, which included a motorcycle guy, uh, just drew flocks of young people into his church the old people just groused and groused and groused and groused, right? Um, so I don't think there's one size fits all solutions. Yeah, we live in a very complex culture and there's not a whole lot of dialogue going on between the various strata. Education again. Um, the more sophisticated level will be if we can find a symbolism that really does um, Interpret the, you know, interpret these things the way the the toxis of this iconography did. I was hoping you'd give us some insight. It would. I could. Um, <laughs> this this same iconographer I told you about, the one who did the Yupik, Mother Olga. And I have had very long talks about this kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> um, me, I'm going to take the prerogative. Let me turn it over to you, yeah. and I'll think about it. Well, let me jump in here because we are running out of time, um, and we've got. I'm not. We're not going to be able to get to people who are already standing at the microphones. And I'm going to give the last question here to to, to Father here um, because he had put himself in the queue. So we only have a few more minutes left before lunch, and I imagine there's some growling stomachs out there. <laughs> I, uh, at every one of these sessions, uh, 
that we've had in this wonderful symposium, I just want to say, wow. I mean, uh, this session, as the others too, have just been uh, terrific. Um, but I'd like to make a comment, uh, pose a, uh, a question or a problem for each one of you uh, with respect to Professor Schneider. Um, the question of created in the image and likeness of God, if I can, uh, you know, dredge things up from my uh, distant past, which is fast disappearing from my memory, uh, the fathers, especially the Greek fathers, went on and on about the distinction between um, image and likeness. And if I recall correctly, uh, the image uh, is the image of God, which then becomes our likeness, the likeness for us by, by uh, the, our attempt to receive what that image has given to us, which of course is the reflection of what we're supposed to be. Um, and then for Father Tom, uh, uh, I was extremely interested by uh, not only your whole presentation, which was wonderful, but by the uh, your remark that we have to uh, return maybe to a, uh, a new uh, naivete, uh, um, in other words, kind of uh, <laughs> wipe the blackboard clean. And uh, I was wondering in that context, I mean, in the course of my uh, you know, career being ancient of days, I've been in contact with so many people in the field of of church renewal, uh, Frank Kosmosik, uh, uh more recently Richard Bosco, and so forth. And uh, you know, a lot of the stuff they do, uh, I like. But of course, uh, I realize that uh, um, well, I like that is not a very intelligent uh, uh, answer. How do you res respond to people who say, "Well, I like it"? Uh, it's not enough to like it. You have to know something about it too. Um, I was wondering if in those, among those church uh, renovators, there's anyone of those previous or present generations that, uh, that you kind of thought were onto what should be done. Uh, thanks. Okay, um, to, to the first point about the distinction between image and likeness, I would uh, agree and agree that, agree that the fathers make a serious distinction about that. So in, in, a, in a sense, I'm trying to cope with that distinction by using this mirror, reviving this mirror metaphor that was the common language of uh, the fathers, including desert fathers, monks, um, uh, did, Desert Fathers speak of themselves, are spoken of as mirrors of Christ, and so on and so on. Um, the modern twist on that then would be um, the hermeneutic circle that joins, you know, your the eyes that see your image in the mirror and then reflect on what it means, right? And therefore, you have to supply interpretation, meaning there's a relationship established by image and likeness, not just a distinction. Um, I heard an exceedingly interesting uh, psychological talk, science psychological talk, um, that uh, it seems that we actually tend to think of ourselves as the person we see in the mirror. And in fact, the person we see in the mirror is a 180 degree mirror image of ourselves. So left hand becomes right hand and right hand becomes left hand. And it takes a, a real jolt to say, you know, that's not, that's, that's me, but that's not me. I'm, me is the person who parts his hair on the left and not on the right. Um, that's why in some ways icons are so particularly useful because if we're going to adopt this mirror relationship with them, hermeneutic relationship with them, it's rather important that the person in the icon not be identically us, right? Um, it's, it's bad education if we tell people your job, your job is to grow up to be like St. Ambrose, to be like St. Martin, to be like Anthony the Great, to be whoever, right? Nowadays, we all want to be Gregory Palamas. 
Um, no, right? There's a dialogue going on between you and them. So that's that's what I would say about the mirror thing. Yeah, uh, there's no uh, no shortage of certainty among liturgical artists and designers, and I suppose if I if, uh, I pray for something in the work that I do, and I think uh, the work of, of artists in general is uh, for the gift of humility. Uh, to stand before the something that's beautiful and just shut up, that's step one. And not turn on all of the, the critical facilities. And to stand before something that's hokey and forgive it for being hokey. Uh, that, I think this second night, and, and you hit it exactly, I, I teach art history, and when I'm teaching my students about the, uh, the hermeneutical circle, you know, you understand the parts to understand the whole, to understand the parts to understand the whole. You have to go, you have to study, you have to reflect. You never have the pure experience, or rarely do you ever have the pure experience that you have the first time you see something. The, the raw, un, uh, unmediated experience of something that's so beautiful you start to weep. But if we're reflective people and if we we're spiritually humble enough to to take all of that stuff that we know, and you're you're right about knowledge, but if knowledge without love is just one kind of arrogance. So if we're able to be humble enough to love what we see and what we know, then we can come back to it with new eyes. Pedro Rupi has that wonderful quote about let me see the world with new eyes. And the new eyes have to be the eyes of Christ. So it takes, it takes humility. Uh, I'd like to add one word to that humility, and that is that most of the Byzantine things you see are a social product. They're not the product of one person's imagination. They're a teamwork product. Uh, there's so much deep thinking in them because the people who supplied the deep thinking were specialists in deep thinking. Uh, there's great skill of the hand, craftsmanship in the painting of them and whatnot, and so on and so on. It's, Humility includes thinking somebody else knows how to do something better than me, so I better get him on the team. And for all of the pain of anybody who's been through a liturgical renewal process, it's better if we have more people at the table and not just two experts. If we engage the community at a deep and endlessly meeting out level, we're going to have a better product at the end of the day and a product that's going to be able to move people's minds and hearts in a different way. I, I know there are still questions perhaps not quite answered and questions left unasked, but I hope that we can continue the conversation over lunch. I'm going to let Nick say something because he's hovering here. But uh, before I do, if you can join me in thanking uh, Father Lucas and Professor Schneider. Thank you, Elizabeth, for chairing our session, and thank you for a really, truly excellent uh, session. Um, for the growling stomachs, it is uh, now time for lunch. But before, before we do that, I did want to give a plug. I've already mentioned the, the, the slideshow, so you've heard me talk about that. Uh, several of uh, Father Tom's works are on that slideshow. So if you want to become better acquainted with his own work, um, that's even more reason to stop by. We're not finished. Uh, we have one last session at 2 o'clock this afternoon, um, and we did not save the, the, you know, the, the last is certainly not least. So um, please hang around. Uh, you are all invited to uh, lunch. Uh, it's in the same location as yesterday, and if you don't know where that is, then uh, Kat will uh, lead the way to the third floor. So we're going to have lunch now, and then we will reassemble at 2 o'clock for our final session before closing remarks. Thank you. <laughs>